Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Bishop William Byrne, part two. We'll see one of his videos and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. We have Bishop William Byrne of the Diocese of Springfield, Massachusetts. This is the second interview of two. Last interview, we talked with Bishop about his vocation story, but this we thought we would talk about his vocation to be a bishop. And we're now going to a video with Bishop Byrne. So you're just home from college. You've had tons of fun at school, and now you're psyched to be home, but then all of a sudden you're like button heads with mom and dad because you're not in college anymore. And you can't act like you're king of the castle, like you would be in your dorm room. So here's five tips for college students. Number one, scambio de studenti. That's the Italian word for exchange student. So pretend like you are an exchange student living with a host family and treat your family that way. Number two, ricogli le tue cose. That means pick up your stuff. If you were staying with an Italian family, you wouldn't be leaving your socks around or your shoes. You'd be much neater. Number three, svuotare la lavastoviglia. That means empty the dishwasher. It takes like three minutes while your coffee's being made or the toast is in the thing. Just go and be a good guy, just like you would if you're staying with strangers. Number four, cena americana. That means American dinner. So if you were staying over in Europe, you might go and make dinner for that host family, like burgers and hot dogs. So do that for your own family. Go to the store, pay for it yourself, buy dogs or burgers or brats, grill them up, get paper plates so that it's easy cleanup, and treat your family to dinner. Number five, vaya a la mesa, go to mass. That's the most important thing. You wanna show your host family that you are a person who's grateful for all the gifts that God's given you, so do that. Go once, at least once a week, and thank God for all the blessings that he's given you. Five tips for college students. Ciao. Welcome again to Bishop William Byrne of the Diocese of Springfield, um, Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Bishop, for being with us again uh, for a second show to just talk about again your life. Uh, we kind of went through your early discernment, uh, your early family life, and you discerning the priesthood and kind of introduced your book. But maybe now with this show, talk about your call to the episcopacy. You know, the call to the priesthood is, is one thing, but a call to be a bishop is quite another thing. Absolutely. Thank you, Father John Paul. It's so great to be with you again. Uh, yeah, they, it, because it's literally a call. It's a phone call. Yeah. Where's my phone? Come around here. Yeah. It's not like just a, a yearning in your heart. Uh, if, you, if you've got a yearning in your heart to be a bishop, that's not a good sign necessarily. <laughs> and... Uh, because I was sitting, waiting for an appointment to show up. The receptionist at my parish, Our Lady of Mercy in Potomac, where I was the pastor, happily as a pastor, uh, she was out that day. So I was sitting at the receptionist desk, waiting for my appointment to show up, when a number came up on my cell phone that was a 202, which is a Washington area code. And I, as all of us shouldn't do, if it comes up and I don't know the number, I don't pick it up, uh, because it's gonna be some kind of goofy robo call. So I just like let it go to push it to decline. And then a, a message came up and I was like, mm, wonder what that is. So I listened to it and I, and the voice said, it was a French accent. And uh, it says, hello, Father Bill Byrne. This is Archbishop Christophe Pierre, Apostolic Nuncio. Please call me at your earliest convenience. Did your heart stop? Thought, yeah, I was like, and my hand started shaking, and I said, he's not calling me for my <laughs> pasta recipes. He's not calling me to find out. He, I don't know, I, so I, I went into the private space, and he said, um, Father, uh, this, Father Bill Byrne, uh, how are you? And I said, fine. <laughs> and he said, 
it's nice weather we're having, isn't it? And I was like, small talk? Where yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> Stop the small talk. Let's just get to it. <laughs> and he said, the Holy Father would like to, is appointing you to be, has appointed you to be the bishop of, and then he kind of pauses, like, like almost in a mental drum roll. And he says, the bishop of Springfield, Massachusetts. And then with about zero hesitation, he said, without any pause, he says, do you accept? Like, that's the... That's the discernment you get for that call. And uh, like one nanosecond. It's not like, call me, think about it, call yeah. me tomorrow, you know, pray about it a little bit. And I said, yes, I do accept. If that's what the Holy Father wants me to do, I will do. And then he said, okay, expect a call from these, you know, Archbishop, uh, I mean, Cardinal O'Malley and the Metropolitan. And, um, and so then I went and I was like right on my knees. I was like, mm. okay, Lord. This is what you're asking me. This is what I'll do. I just need you to give me everything I have, all that you need to give me. And to make sure through it all, that was my prayer. Right. Especially for those 12 days where you can't tell anybody. Not even your mom? And you're, well, I told her the day I was leaving to fly up. Okay. My mom's 98 and a half years old. Yeah. So it's not good to throw too many big surprises <laughs> at a 98. I mean, she lives her. She's a daily communion still. She lives by herself. She's yeah. remarkable. But yeah. I didn't want her to find out about it. Yeah, I saw her at your ordination. So, yeah, she's amazing. But um, so in those days, I was just like, Lord, let this be all about you and not about me throughout the whole process. And that's still my prayer. Every day when I make my morning offering, it's like, Lord, as soon as I open my eyes, I'm like, let it be about you. Bishop, just backing up a little bit, when you were pastor of, I believe it was St. Peter's on Capitol Hill, yes. how, how did that contribute to your priesthood and ministering to congresswomen and congressmen? Yeah, so one of the things that I soon discovered as I got to know these uh, the, the people leading our country is that there was a lot of isolation. They would fly in. In days gone by, you would move to, to D.C. because you couldn't go flying back and forth. But now many of them uh, fly in on a Monday, fly out on a Thursday. It's so expensive to live on Capitol Hill that many of them sleep in their offices. Mm. Um, and so I, uh, with in discussion with some um, uh some of the congressmen, we decided to do a monthly dinner for Catholic congressmen or any congressman that wanted to show up. And I would do it nice. I'd have a catered come in. I would also have the, the little person cook extra food in those little takeout boxes because hmm. they were going back to their offices and they could have it for lunch the next day or whatever. And they took off their coats and started chatting. And many would say something like, oh, yeah, I'm a twin. And they'd say, really? You're a twin? Or I have a uh, daughter at Notre Dame, like, I have a kid at, you know, like, they didn't ever have these human conversations. And so it was, it was a, a ministry to the people and not to the office. Yes. Of yes. Helping them. So it was a really beautiful um, experience. And it still continues uh, to this day through the current pastor there of really trying to create community. Tell us what it's like to be a bishop in the middle of a pandemic and how has that really helped to form your own heart as a as a shepherd and reaching out to god's people so having never been a bishop not in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> it seems pretty normal to me yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not like i have a lot of experience to com compare and contrast it to none of us do uh, at, at first it was uh, i mean Everything was scaled down for my ordination. So what it would have been a cathedral that seats eight or nine hundred people is uh, was all socially distanced out. And but the beauty of that is, as opposed to having throngs of people, I had my family, and I had close friends and close priest friends. So it created a, actually a very intimate experience for me, as opposed to it being this you know big crowds of people that I never got to visit with anybody. So um, so that was unusual, but also a blessing. 
as a, as you can tell from the title of my book, I'm a chronically hopeful person. So I'm yeah. like, okay, well, let's just find the beauty in this. Um, yes. At first, it was very challenging in the sense of just getting to know people. The staff was sort of in it, not really fully um, in. And uh, so there was some uh, isolation, I would say. Uh, the beauty of that was, so I didn't get to know the leaders that much. I was able to get out and meet priests. I called them up and say, can we take a walk outside? I just want to get, you know, just so we can, I can put names to faces and uh, get to experience that. Um, but also because of that, it it really caused me at the very outset of my episcopacy to rely on the Lord. Mm. You know, you wake up and you're like, I'm in Western Massachusetts. I know nobody. Yeah. And, um, and that can be a little, a little jarring at first and maybe feel a little bit isolating. And then Lord, I would always start my, my daily Holy hour, which is key to everything. Always all the time to a happy priesthood, to a happy religious life, to a happy life Mm. is that daily Holy hour. Mm. And as I would go to the Lord, and I'd be like, "Lord, I'm I'm here," and He'd say, "Lean in, hmm. lean in. You're I'm here, and hmm. that's the whole point." Hmm. So, so the blessing of that initial experience was there wasn't all the uh, chaos of just adapting. It allowed me to adapt to being His bishop here, for and with, in Him and through Him and with Him, if you will. Uh, so. Although it was isolating at first, but I've hit the ground running. I mean, yeah. as soon as everything opened, I would be there. I've shown up. I've been to almost all my parishes a couple times. That's great. Um, and gotten to know loads of people, and uh, so, so, and we, and it caused us to do more things online. I welcome the opportunity uh, just to to adapt to pivot. Yeah, I wanted to encourage our viewing, viewing audience uh, to pray for you, to pray for all bishops, especially uh, during these times. Uh, we, all bishops, all priests, we need, we need prayers to exercise the ministry of the gospel that's been entrusted to us. Um, Bishop, Thank you. And uh, go, go I was going to say, you know, the New England and much of Massachusetts still is reeling in a a, a very real way from the clergy sex abuse crisis. Yes. It so devastated mm-hmm. so much of our communities uh, and still makes headlines. And yes. um, it doesn't take much of a Google to, and I've been working towards transparency and communication and healing. And, and I think that's that those prayers are so important Yes, because God's not done with his church, with his people. Yes. There are so many, people to call home. And so just pray for the Holy Spirit to give us the words, to give us the yes. leadership, the courage. So ha- thank you for that. Yeah. Have you met with many clerical sex abuse survivors? And, and spoken I've met with, with them? many. Uh, yeah. And so I've had, uh, I've had many conversations, met with them, met with groups. Um, and so that's an important, we're, we're in the process of developing a whole strategic plan, an independent task force where we're going to be rolling out um, towards even greater transparency. But that is the building of trust. That's then going to be the ability to hear the gospel anew. Well, thank you so much, Bishop, for, for sharing that with us. Um, in your book, you talk about the delightful mysteries of the rosary. <laughs> Tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. You know, I mean, we, we have well, the luminous mysteries, which are the <laughs> mysteries given to us in 2002 by John Paul II. But Father Bill Byrne, now Bishop, you know, Bill, Bill Byrne, gave us the delightful mysteries. You know, tell us about those. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, those, the delightful mysteries are just one of the many. I like to walk my dog. Well, yeah. a rosary, even if I go slow, what is what, 15 minutes? Um, so I end up making up my own new sets of mysteries. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this one, the delightful mysteries are just these little insights into the, maybe the daily what's called the hidden life of, of our Lord and his experience with his, um, uh, with his mother. So I, I, the delightful mysteries 
with just one example of what I invite anyone to do. To right. if you've done regular ones, why don't you start thinking about you know what Mary was like in the house of Nazareth with Jesus and Joseph and uh, these little Jesus with his friends or Jesus with uh, um, just being a, a regular kid at these moments I invite everyone to. And another uh, a part in your book was chapter 22, which I liked, New Year's restitutions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, instead of New Year's yeah. resolutions, New Year's restitutions. Can you talk about right. that? Exactly. Just to make a new year, to build upon the, you know, we tend to think of uh, a resolution as just uh, something new that I can do, as opposed to learning from the, making graces come from uh, challenges. And this is, uh, and they're simple ideas, but just ways of, of, of growing. And, and that's what mercy is. Mm -hmm. Mercy is take God taking us from non-being to being, non-being being sin and who we haven't been to who we can be. And that's really what uh, a, a new year should bring. And you're, you're a commission too, as a missionary of mercy like myself, you know, how has that helped to shape your priesthood as well? And well, it was really, first of all, just the experience of being in Rome, yeah. uh, all of us there, yes. and then that, that powerful experience of being with the Holy Father, mm -hmm. where he commissions us in that ancient it was amazing. Sala Regi, the, where the kings and queens had, yeah. had visited, and then, uh, and then going and being at the Basilica, and seeing the uh, Padre Pio, yes, um, I was. It was just everything that was astounding, and the fraternity of all the priests gathered there, but gathered around not just our priesthood, but our capacity to be a, a vehicle through which God brings healing to the world, a vehicle through which His His mercy comes, uh, and uh, and so. You know, it's like the divine mercy beams coming out of the heart, letting them shine through our hearts also out, you know, to penetrate us and then to go from there. Yes, I, was, I found it to be a very beautiful experience. I was very surprised uh, after uh, the Jubilee year ended. I was kind of sad that it was ending. And then to wake up the next morning to find out that the Pope extended the mandate was like I, right. I, was, I was really excited. Yeah, so was I. I was. I completely agree. When they, when they sent out the notice to say indefinitely, you're able to have the faculties to bring healing to people. Bishop, thank you so much again for writing this book, Five Things with Father Bill. And I encourage our viewing audience to, you know, get a copy for yourselves, for your grandchildren, uh, as a gift uh, to give. Uh, Bishop, any closing words? Maybe a moment of hope. Uh, you're full of hope in this book. Can you just give us a little bit of hope in, in the middle of uh, the crisis that we're in, in this world? Well, uh, it's, it's uh, first of all, um, G.K. Chesterton said, hope isn't hope unless things feel hopeless. So yeah. if you're feeling hopeless, then, then that's like say, oh, this is a sign that hope can really start shining through. Yeah. And that if we want to experience hope, I, my, the Western part of my diocese is, the Berkshire Mountains. And when I drive up there to the beautiful parishes there, I can easily lose cell contact. So it is with our, our mercy, our hope contact. If we're not with the Lord, then, then that, that signal can get weaker. Yes. Not because he's not sending us, we just can't pick it up. Yes. And so it is with our own experience and our own prayer of the Lord. If you're feeling like you, you're feeling despair, you're feeling anxiety, Lean in, mm -hmm. go to the church, spend yeah. some time in front of the Blessed Sacrament, receive the Eucharist as much as you possibly can. Most importantly, get to confession, mm. get rid of all that stuff that's not you and let the Lord restore you to who you fully can be. So it's, it's just about getting back to the basics and you start to feel hope grow. And then as soon as you start feeling that, start sharing hope. Yes. You want hope to grow? It's just like you want love, share love. Yeah. You want hope, share hope. And so often we just notice all the negative. Yes. Instead, celebrate where grace is, not where it isn't. Yeah. So Amen. Uh, 
I always say to people, lean in, let the Lord be the Lord of your life, and you'll start noticing that the clouds start to part. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bishop William Byrne from the Diocese of Springfield, Massachusetts. Bishop, we can't wait for you to come visit here at DW10 one day. We hope to have you here soon in the flesh. God bless you. Thank you, Father John Paul. God bless you. It's so great to talk with uh, Bishop Byrne. Oh, yeah. Brother John Therese, just, just to have a bishop on the show, just so down to mm -hmm. earth and, and just so real, yeah. so funny. He's very joyful and he's got a good sense of humor. And uh, it was just interesting listening to him, especially as a priest, yeah. you know, as a pastor, uh, giving these reflections and, you know, doing a lot of work with evangelization. You know, and the videos aren't very long, but only about a minute to two minutes, maybe two and a half. Uh, but I like how he, he really does point out just five points, just yeah. so five points that are easy to take away with and kind of just think about. And uh, so I think that's really greatly needed today. Sometimes we do live in a kind of very busy world and we just kind of need something just to chew on. And I think there's a lot that he offers just with the talks. Yeah, and just just something very simple too. Mm -hmm. Something very simple and practical. That was one of the things that I took away from Bishop's uh, interview was, you know, he, he kept on coming back to leaning into Jesus. Right. You know, just, yeah. just lean into him. You know. I, he had a great message of hope at yeah. the end there. And he's also a great, I think, a witness to faith, yeah. you know, especially to the call to the Episcopacy, you know, and that's, that's um, you know, that's a very challenging thing, especially these days. Mm -hmm. And just to have that openness, you know, that, you know, it's, and I like that analogy that he uses with his dog. The do his dog is already, you know, you just say, hey, we're going, and it's, the dog's ready to go with them. You know, and to be like that in our efforts, you know, to follow Christ, we need to have that kind of spirit to follow Christ. So. We'll send you out with a blessing uh, through the intercession of St. Maximilian Kolbe, uh, one of our patrons of this show, Life on the Rock. May you lean in to Jesus through his intercession, uh, lean against the heart of Jesus, uh, whatever it may be, like Bishop was talking about hope, to lean in to have trust to have hope in Jesus, that he can get you through anything. May the blessing of Almighty God through the intercession of St. Maximilian Kolbe be upon you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next time on Life on the Rock. God bless you.